So turning now to uh, the question of quality, what's coming down the pipes? Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, we have our moderator this session is Matthew Weatherly white We have Emily Casriel from the BBC uh, and Social Progress and Verity board member and representative of The Economist, Matthew Bishop. Please, welcome. Good afternoon. Is this a cave? Why well, everyone's probably napping. Um, you've all read the, season, the little session pitch. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time setting the scene. Um, I will, however, say that it is a privilege to be on the stage with these two informed, experienced, nuanced, strongly opinionated representatives from the media. And I think it is not hyperbole to say that because of their backgrounds, there may not be two people on the planet who are better suited to discuss this braided <laughs> subject of fake news and the role of journalism related thereto. Um, Emily Casriel is the head of editorial partnerships and special projects at the venerable and perhaps most trusted media voice in the world, although Matthew might disagree with that, the BBC. She's part of the team that informs and entertains over 300 million people every week around the world. Among other accomplishments, Emily also serves as a senior advisor to the Skoll Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. And Matthew Bishop is the Economist US business editor and New York bureau chief, and is a recognized world leader on philanthropy and the emerging discipline of impact investing. So for our discussion today, what I'd like to do is try to cleave this Gordian knot of fake news and the role of journalism in two, tackling first the disease of fake news and then approaching the more nuanced, likely more controversial, perhaps even more interesting notion that journalists may and perhaps even should have a role in developing the antidote to it. And we'll then try to rebraid these two topics together at the end of the, of the session before inviting you to interrogate Matthew and Emily, as I'm sure you will want to do. Um, I'm also quite curious to see what visuals the woman in the back from Ridge comes up with to visually display fake news. So we'll be watching that <laughs> graphic developing over the, over the course of the next 30 minutes. Um, but before we go, I'm going to take one minute of our precious time. And I would like you at the, at the tables to try to define fake news. I've been hearing a lot about this over the last couple of days. I think there's no consensus. And what I'd like to do in a perfect world is to have somebody who tweets from each table define your definition of fake news under the what works 2017 hashtag. And then at the end of the session, somebody will go back and troll through it and see if there's any consensus whatsoever. I think it'd be a really interesting exercise. So to, uh, to level set for a second, for purposes today, I suggest we sidestep outright lies. Lies are lies. Facts are facts, dictators are dictators. But instead, let's focus on intent. Um, the methodology of fake news isn't, I, I suggest, to convince anyone of what the truth is. Rather, I believe it is to make people doubt that the truth exists, or perhaps more perniciously, that it can ever be known. Gary Kasparov observed in a very retweeted comment, the point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda, it is to exhaust our critical thinking, to annihilate the truth. So Emily, coming think, straight at you. I think that's a really interesting thought because it's the conceptual thought around fake news as well as the actual intent of a particular bit of content or fake news. I mean, in terms of definitions, I'm really interested to see what you guys come up with, but I think it can be distinguished from propaganda or from making a mistake or even from parody, which is sometimes included as, as part of fake news, as something which is deliberately misinformed, deliberately not true, with an intent either for political or for commercial gain. Because we've got to remember that a lot of this fake news has been spread because it has made people money, because that which clicks also gets ad revenue, and that's this driver which is you know, a really significant part of what has made fake news so successful. And of course, that's also coupled with the internet, where information is very, very easily shared and appears on people's social media feeds as being undifferentiated. So they're getting news, they're getting information from mates, and they're getting 
a whole her, you know, information from different organization, NGOs, different whole people with a whole host of agenda all appearing, and the source of that information isn't really often that clear. So I think fake news is happening in a complex new world for media providers and for all of us as news consumers, which is a, becoming a very complicated picture. And did you see the conversation with Xavier this morning where he talked about this notion? Do you have any response to the way that he framed the, the responsibility of journalism relative to fake news? And we'll dig into this more deeply um, later in our session. But just in what you just said, it just strikes me that that sounded like the, the, the compliment to what Zav said. I mean, I think absolutely right that uh, media does have a responsibility. And certainly, you know, as part of the BBC, with my BBC's hat on, the BBC has truth and impartiality and accuracy hard-baked into its charter. So that's something that we have to do. We have to be impartial, and we have to do our damn best to be as accurate as we possibly can in a thorough investigation of sources. And I hope that you feel that when you consume the BBC. People might not always agree, but we always forensically check our sources and mostly get it right because that is something that's incredibly important to the BBC. But in addition, in a context in which fake news has become more important, the BBC has boosted up. It's got a little section called Reality Check whereby it looks for the big outliers uh, which are being shared very widely on social media and then investigates them and investigates the facts and then shares that. And that originally started up with the UK election a couple of years ago, but has been boosted just because the BBC sees this as an important public service role that it can fulfill. And Matthew, with, uh, with The Economist, obviously an equally trusted voice, although one with, uh, I would argue, smaller reach than the BBC. Um, no? Uh, probably a little smaller, but <laughs> maybe more influential, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I love these like little professional digs. It's like, ah. <laughs> and, and they're British, right? So, so, so respectful, perhaps a little bit more influential. Um, actually, I remember when I first subscribed to The Economist in 1984, I think it was. I think the subscriber base was about 50,000, so I think you've enjoyed stupendous growth since then. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about this, this, this idea of sort of fact-checking, impartiality, presenting the truth? I mean, I should first say, I mean, I am actually here speaking in a personal capacity, not representing the economists oh, per se, because, um, you know, uh, I'm here really as a founder, co-founder of the Social Progress Index, who has written for the economists for the best part of 25 years, but I wouldn't claim that anything I say has been through our normal editorial processes Properly to ensure defined. rigor <laughs> and consistency <laughs> over time and things. This is me giving some uh, gut reactions to, to your question. I mean, I think clearly, you know, we are... Um, you know, in, in a moment where, as, as Emily said, I mean, the, the whole structure of news and the way in which people get information has been fundamentally disrupted by the likes of Facebook. And you know, they haven't really, um, until recently, been thinking very hard about the broader social consequences of the way the algorithm works, the way the advertising model works. Um, and you know, I think that what's happened in the last 10 years with the rise of social media has been, uh, it, it, not only has it coincided with uh, a loss of trust in some of the traditional media sources, the lying media, as, as Donald Trump puts it, um, it's also coincided and caused, to some extent, the weakening of the funding of many traditional media companies who used to rely on advertising that's now all gone to Google and Facebook. Um, and it's provided a very different competitor to those incumbents, which is, you know, you get your information through the likes of your friends. And, um, you know, I think one of the consequences of that is that, you know, what gets shared is very important. And that tends to be more of an emotional decision. It's no coincidence that Facebook started with like um, as the first as reason to think it's got. Yeah, and only, only later have we got a full range of yeah. colorful emoticons that we can uh, use to say what exactly we felt, but it's, it's clearly an emotional thing. And you know, traditionally, media has not had to rely on uh, emotional buy-in to get stuff shared. People just routinely used to sit in front of the television at 6 o'clock at night and watch the news, or they used to have a newspaper arrive on their doorstep every morning, and they, for want of anything else to do, they would, they would read it and get the news. And now, now it's all about emotional engagement, and that's a very different place to be. So that, I think, and I think that I, I regard it as one of the top challenges for civil society um, over the next few years is to figure out how do we um, counter 
one of the main consequences of this, which is that it turns out that what people really like is having their own opinions reinforced. And um, the, the, this whole echo chamber problem that everyone is now agonizing about who knows anything about social media you know, is absolutely a fundamental problem because it, politics is tribal to some extent. The tribes are getting strengthened by having uh, their market demand for uh, opinion reinforcement being, being met so effectively by incredibly well-financed global corporations um, that are only now starting to realize some of the downside of what they're doing. So I think huge, huge problem. I, I agree. I think the polarization and its impact on society in terms of fragmenting it along a whole host of different lines. So I don't think it's clear that you've got two camps. I think there can be many different types of divisions, but I think it's a challenge for all people in this room in terms of the work that they're doing and thinking through how they're going to reach past in order to create some kind of common conversation. So you're not um, all just preaching to the converted. And it's also you know, a challenge for the BBC, as you say. People want, to, you know, the BBC is here being accurate and impartial, and at the same time, people want to share content. I think often content which is very politicized, which is very polemic, is kind of cool and sexy because it is out there, and it's that sort of content that people really like to share, as well as humorful content as well. People also like to, to have a laugh and to engage and to be cool. And I think what's quite interesting, especially among young people and that's one of the uh, you know big challenge for the BBC especially domestically is that um, you know young people see social media and see media as part of a social currency so they don't just share stuff which is important to know but they share stuff which makes them look cool and I think that's also a big challenge for a whole host of traditional media providers so long gone are the days when a single narrative would be the connective tissue in a society, the, the voice of Walter Cronkite or the voice of the BBC, for example, constructing Although, a narrative. Yeah, I know? wouldn't say that we were constructing a narrative, what, because that implies that we are kind of, the BBC is a big brother and finds a single narrative through which to then convey to the people who are kind of passive uh, recipients of the BBC's narrative. I think that the BBC brings together a different understanding and also expertise, because that's really critical, using judgment of very experienced journalists who draw on a whole source of internal and external expertise, but it's ultimately up to people to make their own minds up and people to be empowered by that information to make their own judgments. So the challenge I think there, and Matthew, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, you know, one of the things that fake news demonstrated in the lead up to Brexit and the lead up to Trump's, um, his, his, his win, <laughs> um, in quotes, um, is that fake news is cheap, effective, and relatively low risk, right? And so if the battlefield is changing, and let's say the battlefield exists between the purveyors of fake news and the purveyors of impartial truth, then the battlefield is changing and the, and the, 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 the new entrants to the field, in effect, have control of the battlefield, not because they're more powerful, but because the rules are changing. What do you think about that? This, this idea that, dem that maybe even democratic institutions can't evolve quickly enough to reflect the shift in the way that people are consuming the news? Um, you know, I think that there is a, you know, clearly a, a challenge for all media companies and, and for, um, you know, I think also for politicians in figuring out how to use the new media. But I, I think this is a transitory moment. I think partly what we've seen in America is that the realization that fake news played such a significant part in the election has you know, allowed um, a number of real news providers, whether they be the New York Times or uh, an investigative nonprofit like ProPublica, to greatly increase their ability to raise the money to do the jobs that they do. Um, and I think that's part of the positive response to to what happened, and I think you know, because we need to have some kind of basic fact base agreed that, that, that we, you know, whatever our political allegiance you know, is, uh, that we share that is based in reality, I think we will find solutions to it. It's just not clear what those solutions necessarily are at the moment. I also, I mean, I, I would say, you know, one of the things that um, I think we need to be more honest about um, is, you know, th there, there is a battle of ideas going on. There's a, there are lots of shades of gray and there are lots of, com there isn't some objective truth in a lot of cases uh, that the media is 
you know, the media likes to pretend it's presenting this objective view of the world, but it, you know, it isn't. I mean, it's actually, it's a profession where the traditional players have a very high uh, professional obligation to, to tell the truth as they see it, but it is still nonetheless as they see it. And you know, The Economist was founded in 1843 um, you know, as a, to take part, it said, in a, in a severe contest between intelligence that presses forward and a timid, unworthy ignorance that stands <laughs> in our way, which is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mission to, to engage in a battle. You know, it, 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 and I think that maybe some of the media you know, has to rediscover what its underlying motivational purpose is to say, okay, what, what are we actually here for? What are we trying to do? And what battles are we trying to win? And I think um, that's probably going to be a good thing for, for the media if they get back to that fighting spirit. And it is about finding the facts and explaining them to people and making sure that society is well informed about what matters and that what matters, you know, maybe we need to be thinking a bit hard about whether we're really focusing on what matters to the people you know, that aren't getting the good information at the moment. I think what you said about explaining is really important because with fake news, we can just think it's about facts. But in fact, people can use the right facts, but use them very, very selectively in order not to give an overall mm -hmm. deeper truth. Yep. And therefore, I think the explaining and the kind of slow news and the analysis is a really critical part of media's obligation. And I should say, we've been talking about, let's say, the US in particular, but of course, we've got to remember yeah. that in a lot of societies, they don't have a free media. And if anything, the media is becoming more challenged in places like Hungary, um, in, in even in Poland, and certainly, in fact, the BBC is just um, going to be starting up 12 new language services, including that for the Korean Peninsula, and in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and boosting its Russian service, and its service in parts of the Arab Arab world as well as in Nigeria and, and, and in Kenya and Africa, just because we're living in a world where there's often less access to free information so that people can't be empowered to make good decisions about their own lives and also to hold their, you know, hold their politicians to account, which is a really critical part mm -hmm. of having access to, to good media. And this all sits under the SPI rubric of access to information, so it's great, it's, good, it's a good segue. We're going to go for, um, for a moment to a video that the BBC has produced, which will lead us into the conversation about the role and responsibility of journalism. But before I do, I'd love 100 words or less. What is the difference between BBC, state-supported, and Russia Today, state-funded? I would think that Putin would argue, and he probably has, yeah. that the BBC is nothing more than a mouthpiece for British policy. Yeah, that's a, you know, a fair question, because indeed, Russia Today sees it the same because the, B well, the BBC, to be fair, is not funded by the government in large part. It's funded by the license fee, so it's funded by the British public. It's an it's a obligation that everybody in the UK who consumes the BBC has to pay a tax of about you know, $200, so it's not funded. But uh, that that's aside, nuanced distinction. some <laughs> part of the new uh, work that we're doing that I mentioned, the 12 languages, is funded by the the Foreign Office, and indeed the whole of the World Service used to be funded by the Foreign Office, so okay. that, you know, that's a fair question. The BBC, even though its funding comes in part, uh, in this small part, from the, from the government, it's absolutely its role is to be impartial. And I think the, you know, the clearest way is to look at the way that the BBC covers its own government <laughs> and highlights mistakes <laughs> and does not do and stands up for being impartial right. and accurate in the face of a whole host of different uh, people, sometimes within government, who might see its role as being, as being different. And I think the way that the BBC covers those questions and covers the, uh, you know, internally and what goes on with the British government or British policy is the best marker in a way that the Chinese state media or Russia Today doesn't do. Yep, fair enough. All right, so let's, um, let's go to the video then. Um, and then I'd like to come back to Matthew for a response. The World Health Organization has warned that air pollution is one of the most pernicious threats facing global public health today. 
particularly severe in cities like Edinburgh, Leeds, Birmingham and London, with diesel being largely to blame. How have the WHO come to this figure of 1.7 million deaths from children under five each year? This is affecting all of us. You can't choose the air you breathe. Now, if you want to tackle air pollution problems across a city, you have to know where the pollution is coming from and at what time of day. Nigeria is cleaning up its act. By this summer, dirty fuels will be banned. On some of the coldest roads on earth, in some of the cleanest air, secret tests are going on for a vehicle that could help cut pollution. Los coches eléctricos siempre han sido parte de un sueño para mí desde la infancia. Y ofrecer una alternativa de utilizar una conversión en un vehículo viejo pues es altamente eh, beneficioso para el medio ambiente y para todos. Across the UK there's a quiet revolution underway and it sounds like this. Public transport is part of the answer. Compared to other big cities, the LA metro is quiet in rush hour, but it's becoming more popular for a simple reason. Because traffic is totally insane. Bad air can travel for hundreds of kilometers to endanger health. The change is because coal in this oven is now burnt more efficiently. This building is always uh, facing towards the sun. My dream was to make solar the lifestyle of everybody. Everybody has to breathe and air pollution is something that we can solve. So to contextualize that video, which I think could be interpreted as a form of very quiet activist journalism, <laughs> Emily, could you give a little of explanation? It's yeah. certainly not activist journalists, but it is something <laughs> new that we did that we've never done before last month. So I've been leading an initiative within the BBC called Solu within BBC News called Solution Focused Journalism, which is not about the BBC creating solutions, but just choosing to focus on solutions, as well as the bread and butter focusing on problems, which is what BBC journalists tend to do much more of the time. And so in order to see if I could uh, try something new, we did this season last month for a week, and um, this just gives you a little feeling of some of the stories we covered, but we got everybody from breakfast news to the six o'clock news, to the BBC Brazil, to the um, uh, Farming Today, to Newsround, uh, you know, to local Radio Hull, to cover stories about the ways that different communities and different from technology to government to uh, business were tackling what everybody agrees is a significant issue, which is air pollution. And it wasn't about being an activist. So we also covered solutions. For example, we heard that we did some research and audiences are really interested in trees. And people think, what a fantastic solution to air pollution. But we did a really in-depth half-hour program to show that typically they can only solve about one, less than 1% 1 of air pollution. Or we did other stories which looked at the stats in the UK, for example, to say that it wasn't true that 40,000 people died every year of air pollution. It was a lot more complex. So it certainly it was it wasn't about being activism, about being activists, but it was about giving audiences ideas of how have my problem been tackled elsewhere. And that's what we were experimenting. And in fact, I'm just trying to decide and think about next idea for a big season. So I'm open to suggestions. Well, hopefully you've had 12, uh, you've got 12 components <laughs> in the SPI that all, all could have their uh, comparative uh, strengths and weaknesses analyzed. So that would be a start. Um, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that what Emily's doing is part of a much broader um, sort of movement. I don't know, it's, you would be at the more, as you say, above the fray uh, end of that. But I mean, the solutions journalism movement um, is, I think, a very positive development. What's, and, and, it, and it's kind of coming up against what I think is an unintended but inherent bias in the media towards negative stories. Um, bad news sells, good news doesn't sell so well, but also internally within publications, um, you know, the professional risk of running a positive story where you say, this idea works, is quite high compared to a story which is, 
oh, here's 10 reasons why this idea won't work. No one ever really holds you to account for saying, for raising doubts about something. Whereas if you put your neck out and say, this is a great idea, and then it turns out not to be a great idea, that will define your career in journalism for, for many years to come. So I think having a, a, a cadre of journalists who are actually going out and looking for these positive stories, not abandoning their critical faculties, but actually saying, you know, the world does need to make progress. There are some amazing people doing some really interesting stuff, and there are probably a bunch of charlatans doing some really dodgy stuff in the same area. And let's, let's get to the truth of that. Let's tell the success stories. Let's highlight the charlatans. Let's actually help some learning about what works. Yeah. That's that, to why me, is a really positive development. But that's why, I mean, it's a positive development, but that's why we're really, it's for certainly for the BBC's perspective, and I, you probably, my sense is you'd agree, it's not about positive journalism, because you're not, it's not about celebrating. It's about looking robustly and looking for evidence about solutions the same way that we do about problems. And yeah, well, I suppose I would say The Economist, for example, as I said, it was founded in 1843 was with a, a belief when, when maybe the Victorian belief in progress was at its greatest, um, you know, to help progress happen and with a belief that, you know, the application of human intelligence would lead to progress. So there is a default presumption in favour of trying to find the, the, the building blocks of progress in our journalism. And so I think you look at The Economist and you will see in amongst all the sort of attacks on the bad things, you will also see every now and again a very good story about how some people are solving some problem or another. And I just think that's a hugely undersupplied market at the mm -hmm. moment and that there's, there's some tremendous characters, some tremendous stories, tremendous narratives. Um, and too often they either get ignored by the mainstream media, or they get treated in these kind of um, rose-tinted spectacles, sort of, here's a hero. And, and, and these often tend to be the people who are doing rather small-scale interventions you know, with heartwarming pictures of, of smiling babies and all that kind of thing, rather than actually the stuff that really could um, deliver the kind of social progress index improvements that we're talking about here today. And I think what's really interesting is that when I've done workshops uh, internally in the BBC across the UK and also in Nairobi and in Lagos and in Delhi, one of the reasons actually when I went to the Delhi office that they felt that they really need to focus on problems because one journalist said to me there, you know, if we don't focus on the slums and we don't give voice to the voiceless and talk about the problems, you know, who will talk on these people's behalf? We need to point out the problems in order to then hold power to account because holding power to account is a really string, strong key motivator for a lot of journalists at the BBC. But what's interesting with in addition to focus on solutions as well as problems, you can then sometimes hold power to account more effectively by saying to a politician, look what they're doing in a neighboring province and they've you know, improved their child mortality rates or their education rates. Why aren't we taking and thinking about taking that solution and using it in our province or in our city? So I think there's you know, exciting potential, but it's a change in culture. Mm -hmm. So holding power to account, voicing the giving voice to those who do not have a voice, identifying solutions and giving a platform for those, engaging with uh, the people who, be, who view media as social currency. These are all ways that journalism will continue to advance social progress. A good summary. So we've got about two and a half, three minutes left. I have one question, and then I'm going to give a very brief opportunity for, uh, for the audience to, to join in. So, okay, a thought exercise. A short answer from both of you. But imagine a leftist Trump, someone who sort of looks and feels like Trudeau, but who acts like Putin. The natural ideological affinity of most of the members of the press, but with Trump's hostility towards democratic institutions, or Le Pen's apparent hostility to core French national values, or Maduro's towards basic freedoms. Would their rhetoric be so quickly condemned if it were in favor of universal health care and free access to higher education? Or would we give them a pass despite their behavior towards fake news. I don't know. I, I, I do look at how Bernie Sanders was covered in the US, and there was clearly a lot more excitement about Bernie Sanders than there was about Hillary, uh, despite the fact that Bernie, you know, I think his engagement with, with I mean, there, there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of well thought through uh, solutions based policy there. It was a lot more about feeling the burn, <laughs> the emotional thing. And the press got more excited about that than it did about. Um, 
you know, admittedly not a terribly exciting and emotionally engaging Hillary campaign. And I think that that's, you know, the question remains open. You know, how would a Trump-Bernie battle have played out and how would the media have handled that? Um, you know, given, I mean, I think American media more than most is guilty of wanting to have two sides, you know, punching each other as hard as possible. They find that to be debate, which I think maybe some of us other parts of the world see that more as punch and duty rather than serious debate. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think I, it's not clear how they would have handled that. Uh, it is a worrying point that you raised that we could have you know, equally, you know, very um, negative forces on the left use, use, this, use these Trump techniques just as much as anyone else. I think it's kind of interesting because on some level, populism is about meeting around the other side, you know, and about how commonalities mm -hmm. of, you know, the old divisions between left and right become a little less, make a little less sense in the world that we're seeing today in, in lots of respects. I mean, I think press, you know, it's an interesting question. I think press would have probably responded in different ways. I think some press see themselves very much as fighting for a particular cause, and those who then saw that they might have agreed with it would have championed and celebrated. And I think other parts of the press see themselves as holding power to account mm. or holding politicians and would have scrupulously um, and vigorously uh, questioned whoever were putting those policies. And we might have seen you know, a bifurcation, but a different type of bifurcation. Fascinating. So I've consumed my full lot of time. So I'm going to just, I apologize to you because I'm sure you're burning with questions. But I know there's one question in the back. I'll just offer it up and then I'll close with a quote um, after we've responded to the question. I, again, I apologize for not giving you guys more time. Nigel Kershaw, chair of the Big Issue Group. Don't want to compete, but we described as, a, as the Guardian as the last bastion of independent reporting in the UK. Um, <laughs> I still think you've got a top-down approach to this. The people who should speak for the people are the people not journalists on their behalf. That part of the reason why populism exists is because politicians said that. I want to go back to the last session because I think some of the... It's a question this. Some of the last um, uh, uh, solutions are about connectivity and co-creation. So if you look at the BBC, look at BBC Three, working with the social enterprise, the Latimer Group, looking at creating documentaries by the under-25s through co-creation on social media. MTV are doing that in the UK, Mexico, and the Far East. We're doing that with Latin Group with our magazine. Jimmy Wales announced this morning they're founding Wiki Tribune. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah. I think our, our, the question really is, perhaps the answer and your views to fake news is actually co-creation of news. I, mean, I think it's a really interesting point, and yeah. I think uh, great to have another publisher in the room. Um, I think, in a way, with the big issue in Britain was way ahead of the game in a number of respects, but one being uh, recognizing that actually perhaps how you sell newspapers is not by saying, read it, but by saying uh, you're doing good for society by buying this thing. Um, I think it's not just the homeless that need that support, but actually good journalism as a whole needs to be sold as something that is an inherent building block of society that uh, fails if you don't have people paying. And the fact that you can get The Economist for a whole year for less than the price of a Starbucks every week tells you um, how underpriced good journalism is and how people should really be paying much more uh, to make sure that we don't have fake news dominating. I'm much more skeptical about crowdsourcing journalism because so far it seems to me you're getting a lot more noise than you're getting signal. And I, I still think that, and even in Jimmy's model, I think he's imagining some kind of brain's trust of journalism or, mm. or the crowd actually directing uh, professional journalists to go after stories in particular areas and offering to crowdfund those, that model, which I think is, that's the holy grail. If you can combine the crowd power with the brain's trust of traditional journalism, then, you, then maybe you break through this massive noise to signal problem and get really compelling additional fact reporting. Yeah, I think my understanding is, is that you know, Jimmy's project, which is st we're still just hearing about, and it's certainly an exciting project, and given his success with Wikipedia, is something that everybody is going to be interested in, is about getting, as you say, I think he says about 20 journalists you want to get up to who are going to do the work, but getting the crowd to decide what subjects they're going to focus on by being supporters, which is interesting, because I think one of the expertise of journalists is in curation. But I, I agree with you. I think, and it's something I think 
that the BBC has moved on in understanding that it needs to be engaging and thinking more about how to work with its consumers and social media has given us ways to do that because it becomes very easy for you know the BBC to pick up on conversations and there's just a new tool Harkin that the BBC is using that I used in this season which allows us to go out and we got 600 responses from audiences about questions that they wanted to find out more about um, concerning air pollution and I think it's a kind of a gradual you know, way that we're using new technology and new applications in order to inform the choices that we make and engage more audiences with that story of co-creation. There's a whole host of really interesting models out there of people doing really great things in this space. I'm slightly with Henry Ford on this, though, that if you ask the customers what they want, he famously said before he popularized the car, he said that they'd have told you faster horses. <laughs> and I think there's a bit of a problem like that. Journalism, journalists do need to have a sense of where the story is that maybe the, the readers don't know until, until the facts are presented to them. So it is a, it's a yeah. continuum, isn't it? So I'm keeping you from your coffee. And I'll close with one quote from the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Brett Stevens who wrote in a eulogy to one of his colleagues, Daniel Pearl, who uh, we know was, was killed. Um, the essence of intellectual integrity is not to look around or beyond or away from the facts, but to look straight at them, to believe in an epistemology that can distinguish between truth and falsity, facts and opinions, evidence and wishes, to defend habits of mind and institutions of society, above all, a free press which preserves that epistemology. This was a great way to think about this whole idea of the role of journalism and fake news and the challenges that we face as a civil society. So thank you, both of you. It was just a great conversation. I really appreciate your, your insights. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.